computer. Welcome. Could you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your work at the University of Delaware? Uh, my name is Jim Richards. I am a professor emeritus at the University of Delaware, and my area of specialty is biomechanics. I have worked uh, primarily in hospitals, uh, working in gait analysis laboratories, and more recently, uh, upper extremity laboratories, primarily with patients with brachial plexus birth injury. And I also spent a large part of my time dealing with sports. So over the years, we've dealt with um, U.S. bobsled team, uh, U.S. luge team. Um, we've dealt with professional baseball, college baseball. We've dealt with uh, skating, a lot of things in skating. So uh, it, it's been a fairly long and interesting career. It's been a lot of fun um, and, and uh, learned a lot along the way. Now, to do biomechanics, that, that's a very specific uh, field of study. Did you do an undergrad in... Like, what was your undergrad then? <laughs> Everything. Um, you can think of biomechanics as kind of a conglomeration of physics, mathematics, computer science, engineering, all rolled into one. Wow. So it borrows from a number of different fields. So in, in my classes, a lot of my students, I had physical therapists, I had kinesiologists, I had mechanical engineers, I, I, had, I had everything. Mm. So it's a conglomeration of different app. Uh, professions with an application towards human movement. Excellent. Did you start the biomechanics uh, field at UD, University of Delaware? No, no, no. Uh, there were a lot of people before me. The only okay. thing I was able to do was I started a doctoral program at UD. We had a master's program and my plan was to be at UD for about four years and then go someplace where they had a doctoral program. And uh, Every time I went to leave, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So <laughs> did you know we're going to build a new lab? <laughs> no. <laughs> awesome. So I thought, okay, I better just start a program here. So we, we uh, started an interdisciplinary program, and it was a fascinating program because it, it involved um, mechanical engineering. It involved our department, which was kinesiology. It involved uh, an engineering lab at a hospital. It involved two different hospitals. Uh, so we had medical experts involved in this as well, primarily orthopedic. So it was, a, it was a fascinating program. Students got a really unique education in it. That's awesome. And the program's still going on there? Just The program was started in the 90s. And as at the time I retired, we had 100% placement in terms of jobs because wow. the students were doing really, really well. That really is phenomenal. Well. That so there's is some, we have some very bright students in there. Very bright students. That is great. I love to, to hear To the that. point where I started feeling like Forrest Gump. <laughs> so, I'll go on to my second question here, my second official one. Uh, you've worked with U.S. Olympic skaters, with Olympic hopefuls, and even college students with lower aspirations. When you've yeah. examined people who are working at the highest level, uh, I'm thinking specifically about the figure skater spins, mm -hmm. uh, do you always find that there are still suggestions you can give regarding the biomechanics of those spins? Or uh, do you sometimes see that, like, a, a U.S. Olympic skater goes in front of you, does a spin, you look at the data, the results, you say, they got it, they're perfect, or, or how does that work for you? Well, we never measured Nathan Chen. Otherwise, we might have reached that conclusion that there's nothing to change because he is pretty much perfect. Mm. Uh, but everybody else, there's room for improvement. There's room, room to increase their skills. And even though they might be able to land a triple if they're a female or a quad if they're a male, um, what we work towards landing them more consistently. So if they mm. could land three out of 10 attempts, our goal was to get them to nine out of 10 attempts or 10 out of 10 attempts. That's, that's how we looked at it. That's, that's awesome. Uh, and I'm sure that as you increase in level, so perfection is nearly never achieved in what you saw, uh, but you still would take some of your, like just your graduate students and you'd measure their attempts at it, correct or no? <laughs> Not my graduate students. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they skated like I did. <laughs> Perfect. No, it's uh, uh, but 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 the highest that our our top three top four U.S. females U.S. males, um, we worked with with most of them, and uh, quite frankly, there was we were able to make some improvements in, in in a lot of what they did. So that's excellent. I love the application. I'll go into my uh, second question or my next question, third one. Uh, from what I've heard, uh, I, I and obviously you've now expanded on this. You worked more with uh, a lot of more Olympic sports than I realized. But I'm thinking about these jumps here. Uh, if we're just talking about some type of tricky jump, 
Could you tell my students a little bit about what types of things a figure skater would need to be thinking about before they ever leave the ground? So you look at the full uh, motion of the jump, and I'm guessing that what the types of things they focus, sure, once they leave the ground, there's things to be worrying about a little bit, but so much of it is before they ever leave the ground. Am I right there? And what we focused on was primarily what they did in the air. Really? Yeah. So it was uh, their like rotational inertia and how their yeah. body was contorted? Yeah. So what we discovered pretty early on was that most of them, uh, if, if you covered angular momentum? Yes. Okay. So angular momentum is a product of moment of inertia and angular velocity, H equals I omega. Okay. So you got that down. Um, what we discovered that almost all of them had adequate angular momentum, angular momentum leaving the ice to complete the jump they were trying to complete. Amazing. What they were missing was their in-air position that allowed them to maximize the angular velocity. So it was never really an issue of their going up to the jump. It was all action post leaving the ground almost. It's what, what happens to them in the air. And That's fascinating. So again, H equals I omega, right? Okay. Yeah. So when you leave the ice, you no longer have any forces, external forces acting on the body. So now they're up in the air and angular momentum is what it is. Right. So it's conserved. You can't change H. H has to stay the same. So now you got equals I omega. So now if you want to maximize your rotation, you have to minimize inertia. Right. Right. To make I smaller, omega has to get bigger. All right. So how big can omega get? We were finding that they were landing quads and some of these skaters were hitting up around 400 RPM. Wow. Which was pretty fast. Yeah. So here's the problem with most skaters. There's, there's two issues. Some, uh, and and the, probably the more serious one is um, how willing are you to let yourself spin fast? Mm. Okay, so let's, let's, let's make an analogy of that. If you're driving a car down the highway and you can drive it any speed you can, there's no speed limit, go as fast as you want, car has unlimited potential, how fast would you drive? What's the fastest speed you would drive? 100 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour. At some point, you're going to say, I'm going fast enough. I don't want to go any faster. I don't feel like I'm in control anymore. Mm -hmm. We suspect the same thing happens with the skaters and they're spinning. Mm. They reach a point where they don't want to spin any faster because they feel like they're getting out of control. And they feel like they're reaching their physical limit and how fast they can let themselves spin. So a lot of it comes down to how do we convince them that they're going to be in control if we show them how to decrease their moment of inertia to allow their angular velocity to, to increase. And that's what it came down. So that's, that's, that's the primary problem. So it, the ice rink was here. That's interesting. So there was the, I mean, of course you have your equations. By the way, my textbook uses L, but we're, I'm okay with H. Sure. Okay, L equals I, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, so part of it's the equations, part of it is a physical, how their limbs even are or what Correct. is contorted there to reduce their rotational inertia or moment of inertia. And, right. But then there's also a separate mental component, uh, yes. like the letting go in a way and trusting their abilities and trusting the equations and part of it there that they're not going to lose control. Right. It, it, gradually pushing the envelope forward until you reach a point where you're now spinning at the velocity you need to spin. Excellent. Now, this, the second part to this is the training, how they're taught to jump. And uh, when you're trying to, to spin that fast, everything has to be in alignment. So you can go on the web and find slow motion film of Nathan Chen performing a quad. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you watch Nathan Chen do this, when he's at the peak of his jump, you will notice a couple things. His body's perfectly straight up and down. Mm -hmm. There's no bend in it. His head is straight up. His arms are right in against the body and his legs are together. There's no airspace in between his legs. So he is as tight as he can possibly get. You can't get any tighter than that. Mm. Watch any other skater do that who is not Nathan Chen and you're gonna see arms a little bit away from the body. You might see a gap between the legs, but there's 
what they're doing, and they usually do it with the arms, is they're controlling their spin rate with their arms. So I'm gonna lower this a little bit. So they're gonna bring their arms out a little more. Nathan's are gonna be right in here. Mm. Other skaters will start taking them out further and further. So we did a little experiment with skaters. We, we wanted to see if, is it really the fact that they can't get their, they can't get enough angular momentum or they're not be able to get their arms in tight enough? So we put hand weights on them as they were skating. We put little six, eight ounce weights on their hands, on gloves. And we had them jump and just go do a double. And double, most doubles, you're gonna rotate one and a half times. Cause you okay. kind of cheat, you take the first half rotation actually happens on the ice. So we put these gloves on them and we didn't say anything to them other than, okay, go warm up and you know try a double just to warm up. To a person, every skater, instead of rotating one and a half times, all these, all these kids were, I mean, they could land doubles in their sleep. Okay. Every one of them, instead of rotating one and a half revolutions, rotated two. So they came down four because the weights gave them so much more angular momentum. Wow. They brought their arms in where they normally brought them and they spun a lot faster. Freaked them out. <laughs> they did it once. The next time they jumped, the arms went out further and their rotation speed matched what it was without the gloves. Wow. So now we asked them to do triples. In every case, their arms were further away from the body. They didn't use the gloves. They were actually counteracting the effect of the gloves. Interesting. Because they spun at a rate that was comfortable to them, even though they now had a capacity to spin much, much faster. Yeah. Wouldn't do it. So then the mental component came in. That's mental component. So the third thing is a lot of the kids were taught techniques that we would describe as less than efficient. So the easiest way to get your arms in against the body is kind of cross them over the front of the body. Mm -hmm. In some cases, they were taught to take let's say your right arm up to your right shoulder and then your left arm over to your right arm. Now you can have them both against the body, which is fine. But if you look at the body down the middle plane, if you look at it down the center plane, I've got the entire right arm on that side and part of the left arm on that side. So now I don't have an axis that goes down the middle of the body anymore. And I have yeah. to compensate for that and how they typically compensate is they'll move the head in the other direction. So now their head's gonna be off to one side. And as soon as they do that, guess what you've done to the moment of inertia? Increase you've increased it. it. Yep, and guess what that does to your angular velocity? Decrease. Decreases it. So these kids aren't gonna be all that successful. So there was a lot of relearning of technique that we had to deal with in, in terms of, in order to enable them to minimize moment of inertia, maximize velocity. The other thing about momentum inertia was timing. Um, we had skaters who would minimize it at landing and discovered that if they don't minimize it by the first rotation, they, they never are able to reach max velocity quick enough to complete the job. So all of that factors in. That's great. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. No, it was, it was wonderful. It was very informative. I appreciate it. Um, now, my next question is probably like bread and butter for you, but probably don't know the pursuit of the quintuple jump uh okay. elusive quintuple jump so I'll, I'll still read my question here um do you think that we'll be seeing quintuple quintuple jumps anytime soon or do you think that it will still remain unachievable there are many people who say it is humanly impossible near humanly impossible you're kind of an expert at least in what is humanly possible with this or you have a lot of experience i just love your take so is it possible? Yes. I was just talking about those gloves. Yeah. Add an assistive device such as that, like a big fuzzy glove that actually has some weight to it, and it's going to help you spin faster if you're willing to use it. If you're not going to do that, do I think it's possible? I would say it's highly unlikely. Mm. And the reason is this. Again, go back to Nathan Chen. Perfect position, arms against the body. Nathan, by the way, is built like a rail, very thin individual, slim. Um, minimizes moment of inertia because his, his, his body's so small, he can get things in his arms and legs in really, really tight. Try to picture a sumo wrestler doing a triple. Okay, he got this giant body that even if they get their arms in against their body, their body's so big, their moment of inertia is enormous. They're lucky if they can get around once. 
So we've kind of reached the limit in terms of where the arms can go. They can't go inside the body. The legs can't go any tighter together. So that individual who completes it is either going to need assistance or they're going to have to have some really, really unique capacity to get mm. like a foot higher off the ice than everybody else. So I think it's highly unlikely. That's fair. When, now, when I'm watching in a year and a half, the 2022 Olympics, if I'm seeing some figure skaters that are doing some phenomenal things, do you know how closely they regulate the gloves in the outfits? Like if you're saying it took only eight ounces for there to be a significant, th there's zero regulation on the gloves. No, there's no rules on it. That's interesting. Uh, and, you know, we've had, I'm not going to say what country, but skaters from one country for years have won the, worn these big bulky gloves and people have assumed they were just decorative. And I've wow. always wondered, were they I'm actually decorative? Watch. That's really interesting. I, that, that's, I like that. I mean, I don't like that. I, I wish there was some uh, regulation in some ways there, but it's a, it's a fun little tiny piece of uh, uh, how big of a difference it can make there. That's, that's great. Uh, I've got that. I, I, I was not as prepared as I should have been. Uh, the gold medal spinner, uh, the little thing that you can, the, uh, it's on the good bearings. It's called the gold medal spinner, and it's apparently used by uh, figure skaters in training to spin fast. It's just very, very tight bearings a little platform you stand on. Oh, I know what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know a gold platform. That. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm okay. sure that your, your uh, people, uh, skaters have trained with those. But I'll go on to my last question here. Uh, this, is, this is wonderful. So just a note on that spinner. What was that? Just a note on that spinner. Yeah. Again, we're trying to train them to go around, reach a peak uh, rotation velocity of around 400 RPM. Spinner doesn't get you anywhere close to that. I can't stay stable. Might get you a quarter of the way there. I, I don't know if I've had a student that can even spin around on that three times. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Not, not per minute, not per, just three times without falling off. The, the stability, keeping your center of mass right over that tiny focal point on yep. that. The skaters do it. Yeah. Those kids do it. They, they, people look at skating and it's such a pretty sport. It's got to be one of the most brutal sports there is. It is, it is so hard on the body. It's ridiculous. And these kids are, they make it look so easy. Can't tell you how many times over the years, hey, doc, put some skates on. Oh, heck no, I'm not getting out on the ice with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel you there. Uh, but I'll go to my last question here. I'm always trying to help my students understand some everyday applications of the things that we learn. Can you think of a specific time in the past few years, maybe, where you or a coworker encountered an issue that you were able to effectively troubleshoot or solve thanks to your knowledge of basic physics? I know you have. You took a lot of physics. You have, you have knowledge of basic physics. You, you uh, were quoting some equations to us. I don't need it to be I omega uh, squared. Yeah, it's, it's uh, basic you know, stuff. That's actually a very hard question because it's, it's pervasive. It's, mm. it's in everything we do. I don't even think about it. I just, you know, you know the concept. You know, it, they're ingrained in you. You don't think about well, if I hold this this way, it's easier to hold. Or I can lift more if I lift it. You don't think of things like that. You just do them. And, and uh, <sighs> probably, probably the one that took us the longest to find was more of a, an energy absorption problem. Um, bobsled. Okay. Familiar with bobsled? Yeah. All right. Let's say we got a two-man bobsled. You got a driver and you got a brake man, the guy in the back. Guy that pushes from behind, guy that pushes from the side. The start, the correlation of the start, the first 10 meters of the start with the finish is like 0.9 something. Wow. So that whole race is determined in the first 10 meters, assuming they don't crash. Okay. So we watched the U.S. team starts and their starts were not good. Sorry, I have a plane going overhead. No problem. It's a little airport not far away. Um, and the Swiss team was the best. So I kind of hung out with the Swiss captain for about a week and made friends with him and watched what they did. And went back and looked at what the Americans were doing. And the brake man is the guy that was the guilty party for the U.S. team. Because the brake man ducks down inside the sled. And then they have a bar that they're pushing off of. So they're... The other guy's standing on ice, the drivers, so they don't can't push anywhere nearly as hard as the brakeman who's got this wall he's pushing against. Mm. 
Mm. So he can really get it going in the first meter. That's, that's what's critical. And the U.S. team, the guy would duck inside the sled and pull it forward and then transition his hands and push it. Well, that pull is where the U.S., and it, and it lasted a quarter of a second. That's, I mean, that's all there is to it. But that pull was where the U.S. lost, lost the races. Huh. And that first one meter was where they lost the races. And so what they were doing was he would be ducked down inside the sled and he'd push off hard with his legs. But when he did that, their technique was such that their arm, their elbows were bent 90 degrees. Simple question, what's stronger, your legs or your arms? Legs. Okay, so when he pushed off that wall with his legs, instead of the sled moving, his arms straightened. Oh. Overpowered his arms. Huh. And so they lost a lot of energy getting the sled moving initially because he was working against himself. He was pushing with his legs and his arms were extending and consequently the sled wasn't moving. So we went back and said, oh, I wonder what the other teams are doing. And looked at the top team was a Swiss team. We have film of them. Arms were straight to start with. So everything from the legs went right into the sled and off it went. So that made, made a big difference. That's incredible. But it was a simple energy loss. Problem. Yeah. And I don't know the specifics, but my guess is something like that. You could be talking about like 0.1, 0.05 seconds. That means the world to the entire race. Like that is such yeah. integral, uh, so, so big of a deal. With something well, that's what you're talking about at the start. But again, it, it controls your initial velocity. So it right. amplifies going down the run. So that difference got bigger and bigger and bigger the farther down the track you got. Exactly. That's awesome. Uh, I like that. That's a great one. Uh, I, I, that's, that's, that's wonderful. That's super on point there. I was thinking like you were talking about spreading mulch. I know when I spread mulch, I'm often <laughs> there thinking about like how much weight am I actually lifting or how many, how much work am I doing in jewels as I'm sitting there cubic yard after cubic yard of mulch. But uh, this is perfect. This is right. Well, you, you think about weird things. <laughs> <laughs> true enough. True enough. I think about how far is this going to go and how thin do I have to put it over here versus how thick do I have to get it down there? <laughs> My wife is the master gardener. I'm the move the mulch person. Uh, so I just need to get <laughs> yes. it where it needs to go. Uh, so I, I don't think about the specifics. She, she gets the aesthetics of it. I just do the, I'm the, I'm the mover. Uh, but Makes sense. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I really do appreciate you taking the time for this. And uh, should we give a tiny plug for UD and your biomechanics program? Well, they're all still there. So I'm, I'm the only one that's gone. So they're doing quite well. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a good program. I, I, uh, I know plenty of my students do go on to University of Delaware. We're not that far away. Uh, right. And maybe some of them will now. I often have ones who are interested in physical therapy or kinesiology. Um, and knowing that there are pieces of that that also mesh perfectly with the physics is a wonderful takeaway that they can have. Well, they have uh, very unique facilities. Most universities are lucky to have one motion capture lab. I think UD now has seven. Wow. Uh, they're all in the same building. Um, so there's, there's some really, really talented people doing some very talented things in, in, in terms of balance and uh, you name it, they're doing it. So uh, a lot of working with the, with the um, uh, military, with the wounded warrior, Mm. projects and dealing with getting those guys back not just capable of walking again but back into service mm. uh, so they're they're doing some really phenomenal work that's awesome wonderful maybe my students will be in your program but well can i call it your program in, in the program that you are so involved in. yeah well i'm still i'm still emeritus so i'm still okay. actually still actually officially involved so perfect well thank you again i'm gonna hit end recording right here